Hello everyone, how are you all doing? Hope you're all doing well. Hope you all had a lovely Christmas and precious time with your family. Hope you haven't ate too much. <laughs> I just had some lovely Christmas cake. Absolutely lovely, just finishing off loads of food from Christmas. <laughs> um, but I thought I would do a video talking just about my life because relatability with OCD is very, very important. Okay, it's when I if I look back when I was suffering, when I first came to OCD recovery, when I first contacted Rob, the main thing that stood out was how relatable this guy was. You know, I was reading his tweets and it was like reading my brain. I was like, wow, this guy understands like this guy understands the depths of OCD, the intricate detail Right now, before I found Rob's page, I had a local therapist. And like I've said many times before, I never down these people. I never discredit these people because the intentions are great. That really um, well intentioned and really want to help. However, with OCD, it's not something you can just grasp. In my opinion, it's not something you can just grasp whilst reading a textbook or whilst googling a few symptoms on OCD right it's a lot more complex than that when you've experienced the OCD suffering the depths of hell the lowest points as I speak about a lot in my videos how real it feels how convincing it feels how hopeless it feels how the guilt, the anxiety, the panic, the shame, the depression, how that feels, right? We've experienced that and we've, and we've we, you know, we fully felt that, right? When it feels like there's no way out. So it's very important to have that relatable person to speak to. Um, and this is why we have the WhatsApp groups as well. Um, because we've got, you can relate to other people going through the same thing, the same journey, the same fears, the same thoughts. Of course, you're never going to meet someone with that, exactly the same background, exactly the same thought at this time, blah, blah, blah. But quite often, the core fears are the same. So people are always working towards the same goal of recovery. How do I change this perspective? How do I change this belief? How do I get better? Right. That's my dog you can hear in the background, right? He was completely settled. As soon as I start speaking to this camera, he's up, running around, trying to find a toy, right? It's typical every time. <laughs> They're so funny because they're like, nope, I don't, I can't have Sam speaking to no one. All attention must be on me. So he goes and gets a toy. <laughs> He's so funny. So yeah, relatability is very crucial, right? And because, for example, when we're suffering with OCD, you're going to need sort of targeted exposures, right? So if someone sets you an exposure and they don't really understand how that would help with your particular fear, because exposures are tailor-made. Yes, there are sh general shame attacks with fear of rejection, right? But if you're suffering with POCD, for example, if you're suffering with harm OCD, um, hit and run, like driving OCD, right? There's tailored exposures specific for you to help you overcome that fear, right? Because currently you're absolutely scared of it, you're petrified, you're terrified of it, so you'd be avoiding anything to do with that fear. Okay, so the target of exposure, hence why one-to-ones are very important as well, because we get you taking the steps towards your fear and not avoiding, not running away from that. All right. So in my journey, relatability was very key uh, because if I said things like thoughts are thoughts, if I just went to someone and went, if someone came to me and said, Sam, I'm suffering a real event and false memory OCD. I'm convinced I've done something wrong in the past. I'm convinced I should go to jail. I'm convinced I'll be, never be let off the hook in the future, right? If I said to you, okay, um, well, see, it's just a thought. Um, it's an unwanted thought. Um, don't worry about the guilt. Um, that will go eventually. Um, thoughts are thoughts. Um, yeah, you'll be all right. Just stick to life structure. You'll be fine, Right? If someone said that to me, I'd be like, oh my God, I feel utterly hopeless because how real OCD feels and how convincing OCD feels is that it's life and death. It's zero to 100 catastrophizing, okay? So you're so convinced that this thing happened in the past and you're so convinced the only way of relief is by 
maybe handing yourself in to the police, maybe confessing every thought, all the real events, all the false memories, maybe confessing all the time, 24-7 on a loop, like I was. Maybe it's trying to go back into the past and maybe ask a person, maybe ask someone. It's something I did, right? Like looking for like CCTV footage to ensure that I didn't do anything wrong, right? So I'm looking around because my dog's walking around. <laughs> Um, I remember like when I was suffering really bad of hit and run OCD and driving OCD, I'd be looking at news articles and maybe try and find CCTV footage on the motorway of like, where's my car? Is anyone near me? Did I hit anyone? Did I hit a cyclist? Did I hit another car? Did I cause an accident? Like this was so taxing, but this was my journey with OCD. This was the, the depths that I went, right? And that took up all my day, like all my evening, all my weekends, all my months, right? Just constantly chasing away for relief way for relief how do i escape this feeling i don't like this triggered so how do i how do i find relief right that was so short term little did i know i had to venture towards unconditional acceptance i had to go towards the uncertainty the worst case scenario right remember acceptance isn't agreement you're not trying to agree with it you're not trying to justify it you're not trying to support it you're not trying to say yes this is all okay right but you go to unconditional acceptance Right? We cover this a lot in one-to-one. We cover this a lot in the group, in webinars. Okay, It's so important and it works with OCD. Thoughts of thoughts just doesn't cut it. With severe chronic OCD, it just doesn't get under it enough. It doesn't, doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't really see what you're scared of and unravel it and untangle it what you're scared of. Okay? Maybe with mild OCD, maybe thoughts of thoughts could work. Right, but when I was suffering, when I have getting bombarded by thoughts that during sexual intimacy, that was when the guilt was really latched twenty four seven, really really high. Right, I then avoided all sexual intimacy. If you said to me, Sam, it's just a thought, don't worry about it. You're not a bad person. You're the last person ever to have a thought like that. You're the last person ever to have an urge like that to act on that thought. Right. Maybe five minutes, I'd have had some temporary relief and go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I can see that now. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and OCD would go, hang on a minute. You wanted that thought. You thought that thing deliberately at that time, at that, during sexual intimacy, um, during uh, like, a, like a job interview, um, like a speech, maybe you're public speaking, maybe you're playing sport. And he'd be like, no, you wanted that unwanted thought at that time, right? You wanted to think that person's name. You wanted to think that image then. You wanted to enjoy that. That is what it's going to do. So by saying thoughts are thoughts, it ain't cut it, right? You have to go to the worst case scenario that even if the worst case scenario was true, even if the feared person or the feared scenario happened, right? You have to go towards that and work at your beliefs and your perspectives around that. That is what's keeping you stuck. I cannot highlight that enough. I really, really can, okay? So much time is wasted on useless information, right? That sounds harsh, but that's the reality of OCD because OCD is very misunderstood. It's in the dark. It's come miles. It's, it's come a long, long way. Of course it has. Awareness and social media, social media it's come a long bloody way. But it's still very, very misunderstood because unless you've really experienced it and been to the pits of hell, it's hard to understand how it operates. It's hard to understand the complexity of it. <laughs> still got stuck on that word. <laughs> it's hard to realise how convincing it feels, right? Now, as you're, watching that vid as you're watching this video now, you can appreciate that. You know the depth of it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be just scrolling across this page, right? You're probably very stuck. You're probably feeling trapped. You're probably feeling hopeless watching this video. Hope is very important. Look at me. Look at Rob. Look at Nick. Look at Momin. Look at Phil. Look at Jade. Look at all the people on the Real Talks, right? They've had to put in the work that we... The tools that we give, okay? You can't just fluke your way there. You really, really can't. You can't just go, right, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to hope I get there. It doesn't work like that. You have to take it seriously. You have to prioritise it. 
let me tell you about some of my worst moments. Right? If you're in any of the WhatsApp groups, you would have, I do voice notes in there, we all do voice notes. And I, some of the voice notes, I, I know I go into some detail um, of my worst moments, some compulsions that I did, um, life structure, anything, breaking my beliefs, anything. Right? You get voice notes about all sorts of that. And let me tell you, this was when, 2018, yeah, before I came to Rob, 2018, I had a part-time job at a local shop, stacking shelves on minimum wage, just pocket money, right? And this was when OCD hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember one day I went into work so bloody triggered. I mean, even to go into work was a massive achievement, but I just, I was in survival mode. You know, I was like, all right, I need to go into work. I can't let that affect me. I can't let that affect me. I can't let that affect me. But that day in work, that 12 hour shift in work felt like the longest shift of my life, right? I spent four or five hours of it in the bathroom, crying my eyes out. And I went out, I remember trying to push through and I remember stacking shelves and like coming out of trolleys, the load of stock had just come off the the lorry. I went into the shop um, and just, you know, putting it where it should go. And the manager there said, "Um, Sam, have you been crying? And I said, no, I just got itchy eyes because my my eyes were all red. I said, oh, my eyes are just sore and a fever, something like that. Now, how lost I felt then, how hopeless I felt because I was suffering with POCD then, like unwanted thoughts during sexual intimacy. That was a really big one, as I've already mentioned. Now, all I knew vaguely was about intrusive thoughts, but I just didn't understand the realness, you know, the, the, how gripping it felt how it felt like your life was just crumbling apart. I don't understand that. That was the longest shift. Uh, you no, know, I thought I was there way out. I thought, like, what do I do? Like, what has my life become? Has my life become going to a local supermarket where I work and just crying in the bathroom, right? Now, even then, I wasn't even saying this to my, to my partner. She knew vaguely what was going on, but she didn't know that how bad it was. She didn't know the depths it was, right, because I was hiding it, because I was, you know, quite embarrassed, I didn't want to upset her, I didn't want to affect her. But those were the moments that thought, like, wow, I needed help, and I'm sure you've been there, I'm sure you're watching this video, I'm sure you've you've been at those those rock-bottom moments, right? I remember another time at the... I spoke about this in a voice note about a compulsion I did, right? And this was at my early teenage years. I was probably about 14 or 15. And this was some of the compulsions I was doing. I was doing lots of compulsions. Now, I remember I was at a cricket presentation. I used to play cricket a lot. And this was before, like, uh, even though it was thoughts were, I just thought I was a bit strange. I thought I was just like, oh, these thoughts are weird. Like, things were sticking. I remember at the time... Um, someone had just died, like someone's family member had just died. And then that person's name had stuck in my mind the whole time we were playing cricket, in the build-up to cricket, in the build-up to the game and training, right? And I was a bowler. If you know cricket, I'm sure Americans, you, you probably wouldn't, but people British would, would probably know it. And I'd bowl, run into bowl, and I'd run in with my lips sealed, right? Because as you run past, you run past an umpire. Now, I was scared that I was going to say this person's name to the umpires I was running past and then get taken off the field, taken to jail, blah, 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 life come crumbling down, right? And we won the final. And in the presentation after, um, you have the photo taken, you have a team photo, you have an individual photo of the trophies. And the whole photo, I'm trying to find these photos now because it would be really good to um, sort of put on TikTok or, you know, you see the recovery stories to see where I once was, the compulsions I was doing, and you'll see my lips were sealed shut. People who would ask me at the time, they'd say, Sam, why are your lips sealed shut? Are you a bit odd? And I'd say, no, I'm older than a sneeze. But I was so scared of saying something, I was so scared of the camera lens taking a picture of me, and then the thought would have come out on the camera lens, right? There's no logic, but that's how OCD was working. And I'm like, oh my God, how sick are you to think this? How sick are you to think that? You scumbag, you evil monster, blah, blah, blah. And that's how many thoughts are like 14, 15, 16 years old, right? It, it's, it's crazy looking back and thinking like, wow, like where I was, but this is what's got me to around the day. I don't look back and go, 
oh, that's terrible, that's negative time. Yes, it was, the, the suffering was bad, but look at the lessons it's taught me today. Look at the perspectives it's got to me, right? I wouldn't be making these videos. I wouldn't be helping one-to-ones. I wouldn't be doing this job if it wasn't for this kind of suffering and these kind of moments, right? I remember once we're walking to work. This was crazy, right? This was a massive, massive compulsion, right? I was walking to work. How old was I? Probably like 19, 20. I just got a full-time job in a in city centre um, on the 15th floor, right? And when I walked to work, I walked past an industrial state. Loads of CCTV cameras everywhere. Yeah, again, did the classic compulsion, lips sealed shut. And I was so convinced once that I shouted a thought out loud... I shouted like a um, like a really sort of strange, sexual, really odd, like disturbing thought, right? I was getting bombarded by this all the time, all just taboo-related subjects, right? And I'm, this was crazy, right? I remember walking past the CCTV camera. I still remember it now, clear as day. And I must have walked past. If you actually had the CCTV footage, you'd probably be absolutely pissing yourself in laughter because I walked past about 10 times just to make sure, like, did I did I say anything? Like, looking, like, where was the CCTV camera? Where was it angled? Where was it placed? Was it looking at me? Was my lips still shut? I almost wanted to go in, into the office, into this building that had the CCTV camera and ask, can I see it? Have you got soundproof? Um, can you hear people talking? Like, And that, like, I was late to work and things like that. Like, wow, that spent so much time. And when I got into work, like, I couldn't concentrate running out of the building crying because I was so scared I was going to come out. The police were going to be there. And like, you said all this, you said this, you said this. You know, how dare you say something like this? Um, I think people's names were getting stuck. Um, uh, images were getting stuck. And I was scared I was going to shout it out loud. I had that a lot, like, saying names during checks of intimacy. That was a big one. Like, oh, my God, did I say this name? And if I then saw that person, like, so consumed with guilt, like, can't look at them in the eye. If only you knew this, if only you knew that I was scared that I said your name during sex, things like that, right? I was stuck like this for 24-7. Now, people people say to me, like, when I'm in one-to-one calls with people, it's not to, like, blow my own trumpet, it's not to boast or anything, but like, people watch these videos and be in tears, right? Because they're like, fuck me, Sam, like, you're describing my compulsions, you're describing my life, right? This is why I'm so passionate about what I do. We all are very, look how passionate we are on the team, right? Because we have been to the depths, I keep saying, but we know how that feels. We know how lonely, how isolating that feels, right? If I could speak to my 18, 19 year old, 20 year old self, 20 year old self now, I'd go, Sam. I'd put my arm round me and go, Sam, right? This is what you need to do. This is what you need to get better. Don't go back and check that CCTV footage one more time. Don't show your lips shut. That ain't going to get you anywhere. Well, look at your beliefs. What are you scared of, Sam? You need to be going past this CCTV footage all the time. You need to be going past this industrial state all the time, right? You need to start making changes. But little did I know, I know I was doing so many compulsions as a way of relief, as a way of escape, right? Confessing all the time. Like I, I talk about that exact compulsion with the CCTV camera, I remember saying that to my girlfriend about 20 times. Like, oh my God, are they sure they're soundproof? Can they hear you say something? Can they hear you out loud? If they do, can they send you to jail? Can they call the police? Like, blah, 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 blah. So just, just try and remember that there is really so much hope, okay? But you can't just go, sign to watch this video, cheers, Sam, off I got my merry way, and I'm recovered, right? It takes a lot of work. Because when I started changing my behaviour, think of the, excuse me, think of the enormous amounts of discomfort that I felt. It's like a drug addict coming off a drug, right? Our drug is reassurance. Our drug is compulsions, right? When we come off that, you're going to feel like crap. That is the brutal reality of it. I, so I talk about how I work um, on a 15th floor building. And I talk about that compulsion walk in there. Um, but let me just, I'm going to go on to how like I made changes in my life, how I made behavioural changes, right? I didn't exercise when suffering really bad. That was too much. I was so consumed in the mental battlefield in my own mind, in the rumination, in the analysing the past, in the trying to get relief, in the analysing the thought at the unwanted time, in the monitoring how I was feeling, the guilt, blah, 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 right? I gave up exercise, I gave up eating healthy, eating crap. And I decided one day... I'm going to do the, the 15 flights of stairs every day, right? I'm going to do that. Now, how do you think I felt when I first did that? 
I thought, what the bloody hell am I doing? Right? I thought that, how is this going to help? Like, how is exercising going to help? Right? How is exercising going to help with the, with the thoughts that I'm getting? But the point that you're missing is that life structure, exercising, hobbies, interests, reading books, spending time with family, putting a, a, like a routine in place, not, not too rigid, but if there's no life structure at all, I always recommend a routine. Okay, don't hold on to it so tightly, but a routine is, is beneficial in many ways. Getting back to work, right? And I thought, how is this life structure going to help me? How is this going to help chronic guilt? But we have to start taking our life back from OCD. We have to start calling the shots. We have to start making decisions to our own life. That ain't going to eradicate the guilt. You don't just go 15 flights of stairs, signed and recovered. <laughs> Isn't that easy? But it's the building blocks that we set. It's the foundations that we set that make the big, big difference. Imagine at the midst of OCD suffering, I said to you this. I want you to sit in a, in a, in a dimly lit room and stare at a wall for 12 hours a day. Right, and just think about your thoughts. You're thinking, fuck me, like, Jesus, right? That'd be hard enough for anyone, OCD or not, right? So, obviously that is very extreme, but if you're just laying in bed, if you're just doing nothing, just sort of lazing around, and you're, you're just moping around the eyes, feeling sorry for yourself, which is understandable, I've been there, right? But when you start making the behavioral changes, when you think, Fuck it. I'm going to walk to work. I'm going to ride my bike. I'm going to go out and see friends. I'm going to read this book. I'm going to make sure I'm going out doing things that I enjoy. So football, music, sport, right? I'm going to make sure that I'm actually going to eat healthily. I'm not just going to grab the pizza out of ease, out of stress, out of quick pleasure eating. I'm not going to do that. All right? I'm going to not drink to numb how I'm feeling. Right? It's another thing that I did. Right? I'm going to make the behavioural change and put that input in. Make that input for long-term gain. Now, when you do that, don't expect to feel better. This isn't a magic fix. OCD doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. Sorry to break that news to you. But the, but the long-term aim is to change your perspectives and, of course, recovery. That is the long-term aim, right? But you don't dispute. You don't do exposures. You don't work on life structure you don't do all these things that we talk about and then expect to feel better it's not that instant quick change that's not how it works okay you've got to think long term you're in it for the long term now you're in it for the long term okay you've got to think okay day by day i might feel crap today i might even feel worse tomorrow i might even feel like fucking shit the next day but you have to think long term okay what am i doing i'm changing my perspectives i can't quite see that yet it doesn't make any sense i can't quite see a rational alternative yet I'm scared of that exposure. I'm putting that off. Okay, let's do that exposure. Oh, no, I feel like crap, right? But these are the things. These are the steps. Maybe we've got exercise. Oh, okay, to exercise. Oh, maybe I've got to um, start eating healthy. I don't want to do that. Crap, right? But I can assure you, these are the things that we're going to have to start doing for long-term progress, for long-term change, for long-term results, Right? The tools that we learn at OCD Recovery are for long term. It's not a seven day crash course like driving your, driving your, like passing your driving test, right? <laughs> it's not that. It's not that. It's really not, okay? It's helping you to overcome shit that happens in life, for, for lack of a better word. For pain in the ass moments, oh, for Christ's sake, right? Things like that. Oh, bloody hell, why did that have to happen? Triggers, setbacks, loss of jobs, loss of family members, sad things that happen in life, very sad things, very upsetting things, right? Natural disasters, financial crises, all sorts, right? Diseases, pandemics. These are the tools that you learn to help you overcome, leave you better equipped. And I can't highlight that enough. When I look back at my suffering, right? I don't look back with regret, right? Right? I look back at the suffering and go, that was bad. That was bloody tough, right? When I think about the suffering. I'm not, I'm not in some dreamland fairy tale. I'm in reality. That was tough. Of course it was, right? But the lessons and the principles and the discipline and all the things that that's taught me has been invaluable. 
very, very important for my future, you know, future goal setting and, and task, you know, task, trying to hit, trying to do tasks, trying to, trying to do the best that I can, um, just trying to achieve the best results, trying to accomplish things, right? With setbacks along the way, right? Life setbacks, life problems, not OCD setbacks, life problems, you know, things getting in the way, getting over hurdles, getting over obstacles. Oh, for fuck's sake, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. Okay, how do I overcome this? Maybe like a huge, um, let's say you, you did an investment and then you lost on that investment and then you lost quite a bit of money, for example, right? If I suddenly woke up tomorrow, got diagnosed of cancer when I went to the doctors, right? Those kind of setbacks, those kind of, um, those hurdles and those challenges that we overcome, right? That's what rational thinking is about. It's not just, yeah, rational thinking, just for OCD, and then once that you're sound, yeah, you're just, you're just laughing at life. No, okay? Shit still happens, all right? So always think of the long term. See it as like a long term investment, right? That is very, very important. I hope you find this video helpful because I've covered a lot of points, a lot of key points that you can take away. Um, if you're interested in our one-to-one -one services, please email phil at ocdrecovery.com. Like I said, you've got the specialist tailor-made um, sessions for you to help you overcome your specific fears. Um, webinars are great fun as well, very interactive. One-to-ones are great fun as well. There's lots of humour, but obviously very serious. The, the, the job is to hopefully get you better, right? So it's obviously very serious, but it's not just deadly serious where you don't have a laugh, right? We have a laugh because humour is very important as well. You know, you've got to be, you can't just be, OCD is very serious, right? So if we were just totally deadly serious, then you're taking the humour out of it because humour saves lives, as we all know. All right. If you have enjoyed the video, please leave a like and any comments. I'd happily read them. Anything you'd like me to cover, I'd happily read. You take care. I'm going to speak again and go finish off the Christmas cake. Bye-bye. <laughs>